for the past few episodes, uh, we have been here in the city of Boston, kind of looking at the, the birth of the American Revolution. We've had to, uh, the chance to, to visit some amazing places like the Old State House and the Old South Meeting House. And today we're going to another iconic spot that is connected with the American Revolution. Uh, and that is also connected with one of the famous phrases to come out of the American Revolution. One if by land and two if by sea. Today, we are going to the Old North Church. In April of 1775, things here in Boston were about as tense as you could possibly imagine. Uh, the, the British military had basically locked everything down. Uh, it, it, it was, it was a, a powder keg uh, just ready to ignite. And uh, the, the colonists received some intelligence that the, the British might be making a move on the, the military stores and, and weaponry that were in Concord, Massachusetts. So one of the leaders of the Sons of Liberty, Paul Revere, linked up with the, the sexton here uh, at this place that we're getting ready to go look at, the Old North Church, a guy by the name of Robert Newman. And they arranged a signal that would alert everybody in the area when the British were on the move. What we are looking at here is one of the most historic and iconic buildings here in Boston. Uh, this is the Old North Church. And if, if we zoom in here and take a look, you can see that uh, there's an old sign up there that says, the signal lanterns of Paul Revere displayed in the steeple of this church, April 18, 1775, uh, warned the country of the march of the British troops to Lexington and Concord. So Paul Revere and Robert Newman had this pre-arranged signal where when the British went on the march, if they were going to go by land out by Boston Neck, well, one lantern would be hung in the steeple. But if they did an amphibious landing and rode across the harbor to Charleston, well, then they would hang two. So one if by land, two if by sea. All right, we're going to uh, go in the Old North Church because I think there's a lot of history uh, that's attached to this place, uh, even beyond the, uh, the, the lantern hangings. And uh, yeah, we're gonna see what we can learn. All right, so uh, we just got into the Old North Church here and uh wow this place is something else i, I love uh coming into these old churches uh now now this church um it wasn't designed by christopher wren but it was based on some of the designs uh, that christopher wren had done and uh, as you can see it has this old box pew design and uh, to me, these, it's so unfamiliar to me. The, these box pews are, are just really fascinating. Okay, here's one with the door open. So it, if you look, well, you have a, a couple of pews inside here. And uh, one of the ways that the churches would fund themselves is uh, that families could purchase one of these box pews and then uh, give an annual amount uh, and that would help to you know keep the church running and to pay the pastor and the organist and, and things like that uh, it also served a, a practical purpose you know, keep in mind this is the the 1700s and it's going to get cold in here in the winter so this boxed in design is going to uh, basically allow for people to stay warmer uh, you could bring in like a little foot warmer uh, or you know you have people's body heat but uh, Anyway, yeah, very fascinating to me. But, yeah, this place is something else. 
Now, anybody who comes to the Old North Church is probably coming here because of the connection with Paul Revere and, and the lanterns in the steeple. Uh, but that is a, a very brief sliver of history in the 300 year history of this church. So uh, to help me kind of sort out the other history of what happened here, I have uh, Catherine and Emily who we've been talking a little bit and they know the pl this place obviously a lot better than I do. So, so they're gonna help us kind of sort through some of the history uh, of the Old North Church. So Old North was founded in 1723 as the second Anglican church in Boston. The first was King's Chapel but that congregation kind of outgrew its space, so they needed a new church, and some gentlemen bought the land here and then constructed this church. Um, the construction took only nine months, which is kind of remarkable, but it was not built with its famous steeple in the beginning. Uh, the first minister here was Reverend Timothy Cutler, who started his ecclesiastical career as a congregationalist minister, he was working at Yale when he made the kind of um, stunning announcement that he no longer felt that congregationalism was the path of the true religion, and he quit. So um, he was hired by the people who would become the Congregation of Old North. They sent him to England, where he was ordained in the Church of England. And when he came back here, he was you know, situated for a 40-year tenure um, as the rector here. And his time here was also characterized by a real outreach to um, the effort to converting both black and indigenous people to the Church of England. I've moved back up here to the, the front of the church to the pulpit. And uh, if you saw this apparatus earlier when I was uh, panning around, well, this is a sounding board. They didn't have a, a microphone like what you see up there today. So in order to uh, project volume to the people in the back of the room, well, the sounding board was installed to uh, help everybody to hear the sermon. Now, one thing I wanted to show, so Catherine mentioned that originally this church did not have a steeple. And you'll notice that this box pew is uh, decorated a, a little bit differently uh, than some of the others that you see. Well, the, the story behind it, this is called the, the Bay Pew. Uh, and just in short, uh, there was a group of merchants who operated uh, kind of around Belize and in the Caribbean. And uh, they wanted to donate uh, some logwood to the church and the church could either sell the logwood or they could use it for themselves and uh, they, they didn't require it but uh, they made the suggestion that you know maybe it would be nice if they had uh, a box pew right here in the front uh, so they could have a, a front row seat to the sermon uh, so anyway that, that arrangement was made and they, they donated a bunch of logwood uh, to the church and then people could you know decorate these however they wanted so yeah, another little interesting little tidbit here in the history of this church. I've moved up now into the, the gallery here at the church. And uh, up here, you can see just this absolutely beautiful, ornate organ. And uh, something that Catherine and Emily were telling me is that the, the decor now is different than what you would have seen in the 1700s. It would have been a lot more ornate. Uh, you would have had paintings on the wall and garland and different things like that. Uh, but something that's interesting about the, the gallery space, uh, this was reserved for uh, indentured servants and people of color and uh, also children under the age of 12. So we can get a little bit of a, a top-down view of the the box pews there wouldn't have been any younger kids down there uh, they would have sent the kids up here well a kid during church might get a little bit squirrely so uh, take a look at this here is some graffiti that uh, has been drawn or etched into uh, the, the wood here. Uh, so here's one from uh, a Thomas Gibson. Um, I wonder what his parents thought when somebody told them about that. 
And then here, I don't know if you can read that or not, but, but right here it says, uh, no popery. Uh, so somebody up here was uh, no fan of the Pope. But yeah, really fascinating to, to get up here and uh, kind of consider you know, some of the different viewpoints and the different people who would have attended this church. So I just mentioned how, you know, the church looks different now than it did in the 1700s. Uh, right here we can see like a, a piece of painted wood that's painted to look like cedar. So, so this is more representative of what things would have looked like, you know, on the walls of this church. Something else that I wanted to show, if you look here around the organ, there are four angels. Now this church is 300 years old. These angels are actually a little bit older. They are about 400 years old. And uh, the story goes, uh, you know, the, the English and the French have uh, historically had a bit of a rivalry. And uh, long story short, uh, it's thought that these angels were, were sculpted in Belgium and were on a French ship uh, that was headed to Quebec. Well, they got intercepted by a British ship and the British just took everything, including these angels. And then the angels were donated to the church. And now they're right here by this beautiful organ. Yeah, pretty neat story. All right, uh, we're going to, to get up into like the, the steeple area here in just a little bit. Uh, but first, we want to go to the opposite direction and uh, come down to the, the crypt of the Old North Church, which is super interesting. Down here in the crypt, one of the first, I guess, tombs uh, that you see is that of the first pastor of the church, uh, Timothy Cutler. This is where he is at rest. And uh, something that is interesting is directly above us is the pulpit. So uh, Cutler spent over 40 years as pastor here and uh, yeah, is, is right below the spot where he spent so much time. All right, now here's one that is really interesting to me. You see that name, Major John Pitcairn. Uh, Pitcairn was a British regular. He was actually a part of the March on Lexington and Concord. And uh, he was going to be fatally wounded at the Battle of Bunker Hill and uh, was buried in the crypt right here below the Old North Church. So I realize this is pretty dark right here. Uh, but you can see the original tombstone right there with his name. Here's something that's really interesting, is that his family requested his body be sent back to Britain. Well, when the body arrived, they opened it up, and the person inside was wearing a lieutenant's uniform. So there, there are some questions on whether Pitcairn is still here or whether he is in England. But uh, either way, this is the, the crypt that he was interred in. Okay, making our way down through this crypt here. And uh, this is something that Emily was showing me that is just incredibly fascinating. This is the inside of one of these tombs. So what we are looking at here is the actual coffin of one of these individuals. Uh, every once in a while, they would have to make room uh, for more. Uh, Emily, what did you say? There's like 1,100 people? 1,100. Yeah, about 1,100 people who were thought to be buried down here. Well, they'd have to make room every once in a while, and they would reorganize the bodies, and they would take the skeletal remains and like put them in a mass grave. But look at how narrow that is. And what it would have looked like in here is just these coffins stacked one right on top of the other. And when there was a new burial, well, they would have to come in here and, and rearrange uh, these coffins. So uh, th this is also before embalming too. So it, sometimes uh, the church up above, you could smell the decaying flesh down here, which seems unpleasant. Uh, but anyway, yeah, there's the inside of one of these tombs. Very fascinating. Here's a, another person who is interred down here in the crypt, uh, Samuel Nicholson. As you can see, he is a Revolutionary War veteran. Uh, Samuel Nicholson was the first captain of the USS Constitution. 
Uh, I wish I had time while I'm in Boston to go to the Constitution, uh, but I, I just have run out of time. So anyway, it gives me a good excuse to, to come back. But yeah, here's the grave of uh, Samuel Nicholson. Here's a, another interesting grave of somebody that I guarantee you've never heard of. Uh, this is Shubail Bell, and he was one of the people who attended church here. And uh, you won't read about him in any history books or, or anything like that, but this is a guy who did a lot of good in his life. Uh, did a lot of work with uh, prisoners and with helping people to get back on their feet. He also donated a lot of money to the church. Uh, I think he also helped like start the, the first Sunday school here at church. Uh, so yeah, just a, an ordinary guy who uh, is buried here and uh, did some, some pretty incredible things during his lifetime. All right, we're going to go ahead and go on back up to the main floor now. So the Old North became famous because of a story surrounding its steeple. So to tell that story, we're actually going to travel back in time to 1860, when a man by the name of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow comes to visit the church. At that point, Boston and the rest of the country is divided over the issue of slavery. And the country is on the brink of civil war, and so Longfellow is looking for a story that he can tell that will help galvanize Americans and make them feel like they can do something to make a difference and prevent war. And that's where he comes across the story of Paul Revere and his signal lanterns, and he writes his famous poem, Paul Revere's Ride. But he does take some poetic liberties in that poem. So here at Old North, we like to tell the real story of what happened because we think that one's just as exciting. So now we'll travel even further back in time into 1775. And if you had visited Boston in 1775, you would have found a very divided citizenry, this time over the issue of taxation. There were groups of people who were in support of Parliament's taxes, people who were neutral on the, the issue, and people who were um, against those taxes. And you would have found all three of those groups of people even worshiping here at Old North. Now within the group that were opposed to taxes, the Patriots, there was a group called the Sons of Liberty, and they were organizing ways to protest these taxes, including collecting a store of gunpowder, which they hid in the town of Concord, which is just about a 30 minute drive northwest of Boston. The British, though, they knew about the store of gunpowder, and they were at some point going to go out and seize this store. And so the Sons of Liberty, trying to prevent that, needed a way to signal to one another not only when the British were going, but which route out of Boston they were taking. The British had two options. They could take the single road out of Boston called the Boston Neck, or they could row across the Charles River. So it was Paul Revere who comes up with a plan. He says, we'll have a very simple signal. We'll use lanterns. One lantern will signal that the British are going by land. Uh, two lanterns will signal that the British are rowing across the Charles River. As Longfellow put it, one if by land, two if by sea. And those lanterns will go in the tallest point in Boston, which in 1775 was the top of Old North Steeple. And so that's what happens. In April 18th of 1775, the British are on the move. They are going across the Charles River. So Paul Revere asks two friends, who we believe to be Robert Newman and John Poling Jr., to climb to the top of the steeple and to display two lanterns for one minute. Those lanterns are seen by a whole network of riders waiting in Charlestown. They spread out all across Massachusetts, spreading the word about the movement of the British soldiers. So by the time the British do arrive in Concord the next morning, they are greatly outnumbered by American militiamen. And that's where we have the first battles of the American Revolution, the battles of Lexington and Concord. Okay, so we are going up a uh, rather narrow set of stairs and uh, we're going to make our way up into the, the bell chamber, which is close to uh, the, the steeple where uh, Newman and his partner uh, would have uh, lit the lanterns to, to alert everybody in the area here. 
right now I'm in the archive room here in the church and uh, we're getting ready to go up into the steeple and uh, something really interesting uh, about this church. The steeple that we're going up into is not the original. Uh, so here is a drawing of uh, the Old North Church in the 1700s. Well, there was a storm that actually blew over the steeple in the 1800s and uh, the the one that they replaced it with didn't exactly match the, the first one. Uh, so here you can see a picture of the Old North Church in 1909. Notice the difference in the steeples here and then uh, here's something you know showing uh, a commemoration here at the church well in 1954 hurricane carol literally blew this thing over i mean look at that and somebody snapped a picture of the steeple toppling over as it was happening that is wild all right anyway we're gonna go ahead and uh, go on up now Okay, well we are uh, making our way up to the top and as you can see, uh, quite narrow, uh, which is, is not uncommon. We've been in spaces like this before, but uh, yeah, very, very cool to, to kind of see the, the inner workings and uh, the, the construction and layout of, uh, of, of, this, of this steeple. All right, heading on up. All right, so this room that we are standing in right now is the bell ringing chamber. Uh, so this is as far up as we will be able to go today, uh, but the, the bells are in the level just above us. And uh, something that's really interesting that Emily was telling me is that the bells that you hear today are the exact same bells that the people of Boston would have heard in 1775 and earlier. Uh, if we look right here, this is something else that's pretty interesting. So this is a contract that was drawn up uh, for people who would be serving as bell ringers. Um, they were, you know, younger people, children. One of the bell ringers of this church as a child was none other than Paul Revere. Yeah, so kind of a, a neat little extra tidbit in, uh, in the history of this church. Well, there you go. Uh, that's just a, a little bit on the history of the old North Church. And uh, yeah, learned a, learned a lot today. Now the wind is about to blow me over. Uh, but that's why you should come to places like this. Uh, the only thing I knew about the old North Church was the story of, of the two lanterns uh, being hung in, in the steeple. Uh, had no idea about all of the other stuff, but very, very fascinating place. And uh, if you come to Boston, yeah, definitely come here to the uh, the Old North Church. <laughs>